Hello, everybody. It's 105. Uh, I'm Tom Keenan. I want to start this right on time. It is being recorded, so don't worry if uh, people come late. You'll be able to watch the recording. And uh, I am a professor in the School of Architecture, Planning, and Landscape at the University of Calgary. What that really means is I'm a computer geek. Uh, wrote my first computer program back in 1965, so I've been around this space for a while. I'm going to go to my PowerPoint uh, and take it from the first slide to the next slide and then ask you if you're seeing it. So could somebody just speak up and see, tell me what you see on your screen? Wonderful, okay, so you saw my So Why the Lab Coat. I will go back and show you my, my presentation again now that you've seen that I'm in a lab coat. And the reason I'm in a lab coat is to tell you a story. Okay, so the story is, I'm not a doctor. Well, actually, I have a doctorate from Columbia University, but it's not in medicine. But I do have this little artifact. I was cleaning out my basement a few years ago, and I found this. And that's a picture of me, and I'm a lot younger on there. And it claims that I'm a physician at the Calgary General Hospital. Uh, some of you might remember that hospital. It doesn't exist anymore. And I had no idea why I had this card. And I thought and thought and thought. And then I realized I sometimes act in movies. And I played a doctor, Dr. Joseph Bullock, in a movie that was shot at the Calgary General Hospital. And so what happened? Well, you know, they gave me a, uh, an ID card because the assistant director said, that doctor over there, he doesn't have an ID card on. Uh, it doesn't look right. So they marched me down to human resources and made me that card. Why do I tell you this? To give you the big moral of this talk, which is you're all very technically skilled. You wouldn't be at this conference if you weren't. You could probably get away with stuff. So to put this in very concrete terms, soon after the first COVID lockdowns happened, I was in a grocery store and it said, first responders and medical personnel, please come to the front of the line. And I thought, hmm, you know, I have a lab coat. I mean, most professors have a lab coat. And, hmm, you know, I have this ID card. But just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it. So that's really the moral of this talk. I'm going to teach you some things. Some may be obvious, some inobvious. But the point is that you really shouldn't do bad things. Computer security has been very good to me. It's been a kind of lifelong career. And to give you the context, I came to Alberta. You'll have to guess which one of those um, intrepid and wounded bikers is me. Uh, hint, I had a very long beard. I came here in 1972, and I took a job at the University of Calgary um, in the computer services department. Because I was the new kid on the block, they gave me the worst problem that they had to solve, and it was called the case of the missionary on master. So again, we used to have printouts that looked like this, and some person or persons unknown was posting the list of the password file all over the university every night. And it was a real annoyance because everybody had to change their password every day. So I, being the junior guy, was told, figure this out. And I tried to read up on computer security, and there wasn't much to read in 1972. So I finally found the bug. It wasn't so much a bug. The computer, big mainframe computer, was failing to clear out its memory between users. And this rather smart student had figured out that in memory word 112 after the beginning of your memory, the passwords are stored. And so he was able to get them that way. Well, this led to me actually teaching what I argue is Canada's first course in computer control and security. It was in Edmonton. It was on October 14, 1977. And what I can tell you is uh, there wasn't much to teach. I think the course was $65 and it included lunch. It only lasted one day because Back then, computer security was simple. We didn't have the internet. There were passwords. There was lock up your doors and stuff like that. But it was pretty simple. Now you all know it's so complicated that we have conferences like this one and DEF CON, Black Hat, RSA, Hackers on Planet Earth. I've spoken at all of those. And I'm, this is my first time at B-Side, so I'm really delighted to be doing it. And I want to start out by explaining that we all fake images. So I was doing... a a CTV interview out of Ottawa. That's the real window that actually overlooks the parliament building. So if you're a guest on the CTV news channel and you're in Ottawa, that's what you're gonna see. You uh, look out the window and it's a rainy day in Ottawa and, uh, and that's real. 
Most of the time, however, television isn't real like that. So as an example, I was doing a hit from New York City, and this, I had the cameraman take a picture to show how it's really done. So I don't want to spoil any illusions you have, but the reporters don't stand outside in front of the Empire State Building. It's projected on the screen in back of us, and you can see the shot. And the reason I show you this shot is also because faces are so interesting. And I have my students do an exercise where they work on facial analysis programs, and they try to figure out things about you. And they're not actually writing the programs, they're just looking to see what's out there. And I picked one, it's called betafaceapi.com, and analyze my own face. And look, it says I'm 53 years old. Thank you very much, that's very generous. Uh, I'm not attractive. I do have bags under my eyes, I am bald and so on. So to show you this, our faces, even when we walk on the street now, are definitely under scrutiny. And in many parts of the world, China, London, England, you're probably on video camera, and a lot can be deduced from our face. So fakery actually goes back a long, long way. Uh, this is a real photo. It's me out about to do delirium dive. I, I've been out snowboarding this week already, and uh, that's a real photo. But this is a clip from 1995 from the Wild Bike, which is a Banff newspaper. The picture on the left was taken from the cover of a brochure. The picture on the right was the next uh, one obtained from the photographer. And you can see that it's been altered. It's the same guy doing the same run with a big smile on his face, but there are subtle differences in the background. This actually was created in 1995, and it could have been done with Photoshop. Photoshop, I looked it up, actually goes back to 1987. So we really put the tools to do image fakery in the hands of the general public. I once asked the photo editor of the New York Times, could you detect a fake image? And he said, I used to see the razor blade marks when the negatives were cut together in the enlarger. Once it's been through a computer, there's no way to detect a fake. And I just listed some of the tools there, Photoshop, InDesign, GIMP, and so on. And anybody pretty much can use those tools. It's also important to know that photos are becoming pretty important. Entire platforms like Instagram and Pinterest are image oriented. There's also a statistic that if you're on Twitter, if you tweet with an image, the likelihood that it will be retweeted is 34%. And at Dr. Future is my Twitter handle, and I almost always find an image to go with my tweets. Now here's a uh, counterfactual photograph. It's of the Yalta summit at the end of the World War II, and there's Winston Churchill and Franco Delano Roosevelt, but also Groucho Marx and Sylvester Stallone. So obviously this is an example of somebody having fun with images. Here's another one. People said this should be the National Geographic photo of the year. Well, it should be, except it's a total fake. It was composited from two different images. Sometimes fakery is really simple. You can just pick the camera angle. So these look like a very, very brave couple, uh, very much in love, hanging out over the rock until you see the contacts, and she's only about one, one and a half meters off the ground there. So the reality is, Sometimes faking can be as simple as choosing your camera angle. This is a spot in Brazil that is so famous that people actually line up for the chance to take that uh, impactful photograph there. So these are kind of fun uses of image fakery and you know nobody's really gonna give you a hard time for that. But photos can also be used to tell lies. And when I first started this research, I was trying to find a way to explain it to the public and make you care about it. And then as a gift from heaven, the whole uh, Photoshop your daughter or son into college scandal broke. So there we have a famous actress and her, her soon infamous now daughters. And what she did is she went, went out there and faked images of them or had someone fake images of them um, doing different sports, tennis, rowing, and so on. And I'm a pretty good internet detective, but they did such a good job of scouring these photos off the internet, I had to look for substitutes. So to give you an idea, nah, perhaps one daughter number one was a, was a shot put artist. Perhaps this one was actually a, 
Muhammad Ali, you know, in the, in the ring. So these are just, you know, in good fun. But as you know, someone did actually go to jail for uh, uh, the fraud that was associated with this. Photos can also be used in anger. So this is a true cover of Teen Vogue, Emma Gonzalez. Uh, she was one of the girls involved in a high school shooting as a victim in the United States and an anti, um, an op opposing political group that wants to defend their guns, their second amendment rights, has photoshopped in the US constitution, the bill of rights um, and has Emma tearing that up. So fakery can certainly be used in anger. It can also be used in pretty nasty ways. So we just had a whole season of, uh, of politics and here are two examples, Lindsey Graham's opponent Jamie Harrison, who's an African-American man, in this ad, Lindsey Graham's campaign darkened his face. And they said, oh, well, that's just, you know, an, an artifact of the program we use. Well, no, he was deliberately darkened. And in another race, also in Georgia, John Osa, who happens to be Jewish, had his nose lengthened electronically. Um, and again, an attempt to subtly suggest that he was a... Uh, um, someone that you shouldn't vote for, let's put it that way. So fakery can be used for nasty purposes. We are becoming photo and video skeptics. So Toshiba did a wonderful campaign in which they flew a chair up into space and everybody said, ah, oh, that's a fake. So they actually had to release a video containing the footage when they did it. They actually used a hot air balloon and levitated this chair right up to the edge of the atmosphere and took photos of it somehow. So we are skeptical. Now, this is a, uh, a deep fake video and I am pretty sure that you're not going to be able to hear the sound. We did some technical uh, wizardry this morning, but we were not wizard, wizards enough to make the sound come through. So I'm going to, because I've seen this video a few times, I will do the voice of Barack Obama to the best of my ability. And I think you'll get the point. And of course, uh, uh, if you want to find this, it's quite easy to find on the internet. So Mr. Obama, or at least his voice, starts out, President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. Now, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. It's time to rely on trusted news sources. So the man on the left, you recognize as Barack Obama, the man on the right, Jordan Peele. This is actually not the technically most perfect deep fake, but it's certainly a good one. So basically the point of this is that we have taken the ability to fake a still image and moved it over into video. And so this is basically, it's available uh, quite freely on the internet. I have another one here, which again, I'm just going to play for you and I'll tell you basically what it is. It's various world leaders and they are singing along to the uh, Beatles song, Imagine. So he, Trump just said, imagine there's no heaven. And Putin said, it's easy if you try. Now the voices are, actually the Beatles. And the main reason to look at this is to see that they've actually done a pretty credible job of getting world leaders and making them sync up to this. So I won't, because I don't think you can hear the sound, I won't subject you to the whole one, except to point out that these this is actually a kind of low hanging fruit. And the reason I say that is that to do these things technologically, you need lots of images. And the people that you see on here, Justin Trudeau, uh, Obama, Putin, are people who are in the public eye and are being photographed all the time. So if you want to take somebody who, you know, I don't know, lived a long time ago or uh, somebody who was never photographed, it would be a lot harder because you wouldn't have expressions of their face. This is an example, um, and I, Love the reporting of Donnie O'Sullivan. He's a CNN reporter who covers technology. And basically what he is showing here is the use of 
a very simple video doctoring technique. And the first one is, is a video of Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House of Representatives, and she says, and then he had a press conference and she goes on like that for a bit. And she's talking normally. I mean, she's, she's on in years. But the right-hand side is slow down and then uh, press conference, making her sound like she's had a stroke or maybe is drunk or something like that. So this was a really good example. And Rudy Giuliani actually was sending out this video. So video fakery has been weaponized for political purposes. I'm actually surprised to tell you the truth. When I proposed this session, I said, well, there'll be a lot of it happening in the U.S. election. And I saw some, but I didn't see a lot. I still stuck with these examples because I think they're nice and clear. And the White House actually did share a fake video that supported CNN's Jim Acosta being banned from the White House press room. And I won't play this for you, except to say that by doing some video manipulation, they were able to make it look like he actually grabbed the microphone away from a White House intern at a press conference. And this was sent out by the official White House account. So, you know, it's it shows how video fakery can get out there. People ask me where this is all going and I want to show you my friend, Sophia. Uh, she's a lovely lady, carries on a great conversation. This is at the RSA conference in Asia Pacific, Japan. She, she did the closing keynote speech and she is of course an, uh, an automaton, if you will. She has a face made of rubber, which is a special kind of rubber. It's very expressive. But we've left enough of her skull off so you can see that she has uh, computers for brains. And Sophia is quite a good character. I know a New York Times reporter was sent to interview Sophia, Archie Bina, who's another uh, automaton, Bina 48. And Bina looked into the reporter's eyes and said, Sir, What's it like to be a reporter at the New York Times? And Sarah said, for just a moment, I actually thought she was a real person. Here's why this is a critical business issue. We still use paper for lots of things. I'm gonna show you a, a COVID example in a minute. Sometimes we scan it, but there's still a paper sage. Businesses still often use checks, particularly small businesses. They, they have smaller fees, they can keep their own records. Sometimes we do go paperless, we scan things, but then things are even easier to tamper with. Most people are honest, but some aren't, and frontline staff are not trained to detect fakes. So here is proof that this is an up-to-date presentation, even though I've given it a few times before. There is actually a ring that has been arrested at the Paris airport selling counterfeit COVID clearance certificates. So they had the ability to bang these things out. They had the name of a laboratory in Paris showing you had a COVID test and you were negative, and they were being sold at the airport to travelers for 150 to 300 euros. And uh, this presentation will be available if you want to read the whole story. The link from the BBC is down there. So that's a worry when people can go out there and fake documents like that. Here's something that used to work Please don't try this. It used to be the case, that's an Air Canada, maybe Air Cannabis, Air Canada, you'll, you'll have to guess. It's a real boarding pass. Uh, I did a little bit of editing on it. I put the code BVRG in that spot. If we were in real life in a live audience, I'd ask who knows what that means. Since we're not, I'll just say it means beverage. And if you had that, and I'll tell you why I say had that, you would get a free drink because you'd show that to the flight attendant who would promptly hand you a scotch or a bottle of wine or whatever your choice was, because that was their code for people who bought the comfort fare. Now, I have a friend who's vice president of Air Canada. I said, look, I would never do this. It's fraud. But would it work? And he laughed and he said, ha, huh, it would have worked. It would have worked until three months ago. We were having, and he doesn't like this repeated, a lot of problem with shrinkage on the plane. Now, you know, we're not talking about uh, genital shrinkage or anything. What we're talking about here is money not getting collected properly. So maybe somebody says, oh, I'd like a drink, but I only have a hundred dollar bill. And the flight attendant goes, I don't want to make change. Things like that. Maybe they take it in their pocket. 
So what has this got to do with this boarding pass? It turns out that people were doing this so much that they, they don't take cash on the plane anymore. And to take credit cards, they had to give them all tablets. And guess what? The tablet knows whether you're entitled to a drink or not. So this little trick does not work anymore. So that's one of the reasons I'm willing to share it with you. Boarding passes used to be special. This is an old US Air boarding pass. Airlines not even around anymore. You'd have a hard time faking this one because you have to get special stock and there's a stock control number and all that. Now here's something you could do and this goes back to my, just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. Let's say you lose a receipt and you have to turn in an expense account. Well, let's get more concrete. I gave a talk to a bunch of judges at the Jasper Park Lodge and I bought a guy a beer and it's not cheap up there, it came to $22. I found this receipt and I went, I wonder if I should bill the judges for that. And I checked their policy and it said, we do not pay for alcohol. So I went, okay, you're not gonna pay for this receipt. I might as well have some fun with it. So I went to that site, Express Expense, just in case you didn't catch it, and I faked it up. Now it's watermarked because I didn't pay for a membership, but suddenly those two beers became a ham sandwich for $20.95 with the GST added on. Um, the host, the server was named Steven. There's even a piece of my visa number in there and a, uh, a barcode. So guess what? Um, it's pretty credible. Don't do this. I've told you how to do it. Now don't do it. Uh, here's one that was fun. Lowe's Home Improvement Warehouse was the victim of a scam, which was a double scam. People were coming in, they were seeing on the internet for Mother's Day last year, get a free $50 off coupon if you spend $75 at Lowe's. And of course, lots of people downloaded them and they were totally bogus. The reason I call it a double scam is guess what? To get that coupon, you had to give some information. I think maybe even your credit card number. So they were scammers collecting information and the coupons were no good. Photos play a big role in things like insurance claims. So insurance companies are lazy enough now that they say, oh, you had a flood in your basement. Well, send us some photos. And guess what? There are people who go out there and send photos of someone else's uh, basement. Now the insurance companies look for this. And in fact, one guy was undone by his own photos. He filed a claim in June, 2018, saying his truck was damaged when he collided with a wooden post. And it turned out by simple investigation of his social media, the accident, the damage happened well before that. So he was caught in a lie. So don't lie. I'm gonna talk about four ways to fight fakery. One of them is technical analytics. I have some friends who are doing great work in looking at videos and seeing things like, is the breath pattern consistent? You know, in that Obama one, if you go back, he doesn't breathe in the right place. The neck actually has a pulse, which is sometimes visible. It's the carotid artery pulse, and you can check that. Second way, provenance analysis. Where did you get this thing from? So again, if something comes from CNN.com, you assume that it's from them. If it's been through a whole bunch of retweets and stuff, it could be doctored. You can crowdsource reliability. You can ask people, do you think this is fake or not? And then there's a fairly sophisticated approach of actually registering videos and images, and you can even use the blockchain. So the first one, technical analysis, and just about anybody knows how to do this. You can just go into a, you know, Windows Explorer and you can look at videos. My purpose with this one, I thought I could capture the Obama deep fake with closed captioning. And I did turn on the captioning and then I looked and I realized the two files with or without captioning were identical in length, identical in video running time. So that, I used that to answer my question. But you know, if a file has been tampered with, the checks, the um, size and length might have changed. We can move up to checksums. I'll bet you all know what it is, but for anybody who doesn't, it's an extra bit of information, like an extra digit to, to compensate for errors. So communication errors, people writing things down errors. Let's say you want to send 3892, you send 38924, four is the check sum of the digits you add them and keep adding as you get down to a single digit. And you've agreed beforehand that the last digit will be the checksum. 
So I'm sure all of you know that. I did come up with some ideas around checksums, and I decided I wanted to know how Hollywood does it. Okay, first of all, there's problems with checksums. It's possible to make two mistakes, and they offset each other. So more than one video could have the same checksum. Also, if you're really smart and know the algorithm, you may be able to invisibly, invisibly defeat it. Anybody who's heard the word steganography would know what I'm talking about there. I went to see what Hollywood does because somebody told me, oh, they must have really fancy checksums. Well, they actually don't. So let's say Hollywood's shooting a movie in Calgary. Every day, the digital footage is sent back to the producers and they want to make sure it hasn't been corrupted somehow. They use SHA-1 and MD-5, which are very common checksum algorithms available to everybody. Provenance analysis. I show you this because in another life, I, I was a reporter in Washington, D.C. I covered the State Department. And rather than all of us putting our microphones up in front of the Secretary of State, we had what this is called a breakout box, and we just plugged into that. So there was a pool feed of the signal. And they still use these today, more high tech looking. The point is that if you got it off the breakout box, hey, you knew that it was real. You knew that this was actually coming from an authoritative source. There's also a kind of out of band validation. So at one point, this was Justin Bieber's uh, page on social media. I am not responsible for the location of the blue check on Justin, except to point out that that blue check is the point of this slide. It means that he has been validated on this site through an out of band process, meaning not on the site itself, but maybe his agent or his lawyer proved that this is really his bona fide, real Justin Bieber site. So that's another way to check things. You can go outside of the normal channel and check it that way. Here's my story about crowdsourcing. There's a wonderful professor, very smart guy, but also very mischievous guy. He encourages his students to come up with fake stories and put them on the internet and back them up with things like old newspaper clippings and things like that. The most famous one was that there were, as late as I think the 1920s, still pirates in Chesapeake Bay off the coast of Maryland. And he had stories about that, that his students totally faked. And that was so credible, it got picked up by the newspaper USA Today. Well, his most recent one involves some girls supposedly discovering a chest that belonged to her grandfather and she opened it up and it showed that he was a serial killer. I think there even were you know, trophies from the victims. And it was a total fake and it was debunked in 22 minutes by the crowd on Reddit. So it's getting a lot harder to fake stuff. Then there's a system I came up with. I was going to patent it or try to market it, but great ideas happened to many people. There's a company in California with a similar idea. You take a trusted source, so going back to the Jim Acosta video, that source sends the original video and computes the checksum. You put those on a blockchain. I won't go into details of blockchain, except to say they're hard to tamper with. And if you do, it's evident. And then you can't, if another version of that video shows up, because it's later on the blockchain, it actually shows up. It's easy to determine tampering. Uh, and you can find out which is the earliest version. Maybe not the true one, but certainly the earliest version. I took this to the head of the Oxford Internet Institute. Very wise guy. And he said, that'll never work. You have too much work. You know, how are you going to do this? You know, got to make your own blockchain. Somebody will take over your blockchain. And I said, uh, yeah. And I went home and thought about it, looked into the technical specs for Bitcoin. And guess what? There's a comment field in there that's not used. So all you need to do to implement this is put your little video checksum in that comment field. You would have to give one Satoshi, which is like a millionth of a Bitcoin in value. But I know a blue jeans manufacturer that actually uses the Bitcoin to secure the authenticity of their jeans. So it's not a big deal to give a tiny amount of money in Bitcoin for that. So I hope today I've convinced you of a few things. Fakery is fun. I certainly enjoy reading about it and researching it. It's not fun if you're the victim, like our Air Canada. Um, 
if you're, you're all smart enough to do this fakery or alter a photo or tweak a boarding pass, just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it. I always close my talk with the very same image here. It predates the internet, free to good home, beautiful six month old male kitten, orange, caramel, tabby, playful, affectionate, or handsome 32 year old husband, personable, funny, good job, doesn't like cats, says he goes or the cat goes, call Jennifer, here's your phone number, come see both and decide what you'd like. Uh, this predates the internet, I don't even remember where I got it from. Every time I'm in a new area code, I sometimes get bored and try that number to see if Jennifer is there, but I've never found Jennifer. The point of this, and why do I would close on this, is for you to remember you're making choices. Every time you use a piece of technology, you buy a Nest thermostat, I know how to hack it. I have to have physical hands-on access to it, but I can redo its firmware, and I can control the heat in your house. You buy a Jeep Grand Cherokee. It's actually a fairly hackable car. Just read or go to YouTube and look at some of the old DEPCON videos. So we're always taking some kinds of risks. And when you trust an image, you're taking a risk. And it really comes down to how much are you trusting it? Why are you trusting it? And do you want to trust it? So these are my coordinates. That is my book. It's available on Amazon. It's even available at walmart.com of all places. And uh, with that happy note, I'm going to stop sharing, which with any luck will bring me back, show you uh, my face in my lab coat. And um, I am now going to have a look at the chat. And you hear me loud and clear. That's good. Uh, everything is good. That's good. For YouTube, you may want to open a new tab. Yeah, I could have done that. That's true. Um, I'll let you guys hunt down those videos. I'm a professor. That's your homework assignment. Heard of some folks modifying the QR code on their ticket? Yes. Um, that can be done. <laughs> uh, most lounges uh, have attendance there. And if you're too scruffy, they might notice. But I can tell you that there's an Air Canada lounge in Regina that's totally unattended. Um, the other thing, though, is and, and brings us to a very topical thing. Boris Johnson, I think it was, or no, ScoMo, Scott Morrison in Australia, posted something you should never do. He posted his boarding pass which contains a lot of information in it. So some hacker, and I'm using the good white hat hacker there because he didn't do anything bad with it. He got the prime minister of Australia's passport number out of his boarding pass. Uh, isn't fraud a crime? Yes, fraud is a crime. I told you that I did not put BVRG on my boarding pass and try to get a few drink. It's um, misdemeanor is actually, it's an interesting word. Uh, felony, misdemeanor are actually U.S. concepts. There are different degrees of seriousness. And uh, uh, Rob Millman, not in Canada, thanks to the CRTC. Um, that's a little cryptic. If you want to put another line in there, uh, uh, maybe I can address that. Uh, I, oh, you mean, the, yes, okay, I do know what you're talking about. The system that allowed the Jeep hacking, and you're pretty good, was actually never made available in Canada. Okay, so I think involved OnStar or something like that. So uh, uh, you're far too technical, Rob Millman. I know exactly what you're talking about. And uh, I'll give you an answer to that. But you go to the U.S. and you rent a Jeep Grand Cherokee. And while we're on the subject of rental cars, um, um, there is a, uh, a rather famous man who started a computer security company. And I think you know what I'm talking about. I don't actually want to mention his name. And when I was at DEF CON two years ago, he invited me to go meet him. He said, I have this great new idea. It involves the blockchain, blah, 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 blah. Uh, I want you to meet me at 2.30. At and it being DEF CON, I don't know how many of you have been to DEF CON, 2.30 uh, could be AM or PM. It turned out it was AM. And he also said, um, I want you to meet me at this location. And I checked it out, and it was an off-the-strip strip club. So a rather disreputable place. Okay, And so this great name in computer viruses was supposedly going to meet us there. I met his PR person. Uh, she bought us some drinks. He never did show up. But the reason I bring that up with cars is you can be sure when I return my rental car in Las Vegas, I cleaned out the GPS on it because I didn't want somebody to know that 
that I was at Misty Strip Club or whatever it was called at 2.30 in the morning, even though I was going there to meet this rather famous computer virus guy who's uh, uh, kind of a weird one. So uh, anyway, you might as well know there's two GPSs in rental cars. There's the one that you can possibly rent. There's also one in the hidden away in the car somewhere. And a person from Ontario discovered that when he returned a car thinking it was going to be $300 and it was $1,800 because he had signed on the contract. It was a small rental car company in California. I agree to pay a dollar per mile when I drive outside of the state of California. Not noticing that, he drove all over the place, Arizona, Nevada, came back and got this big bill, which last I heard they were still trying to enforce. So I'm happy to have more questions. I don't know if you're able to do them by voice or in the chat line or something like that. I think these sessions are slated to be 15 minutes. I'm honestly not totally up to speed on that. Um, but um, uh, I can tell you that all those videos that I showed are, are easy to find. And you know, with the recording of this, you'll be able to track them down. Um, so Rob, uh, since you obviously know a lot about this, do you have another one for me? <laughs> oh, you said the guy's name. I didn't really want to say his name. Um, yeah, I have some other stories about that rather famous guy, uh, computer virus guru. He was in a place in South America, and he almost got uh, arrested. And it's not a good place to get arrested. And I investigated why. And it turned out he lived on an island. There was a ferry service run by locals. He didn't like their schedule, so he hired a, another local to start a competing ferry service with the old folks who had been there running that business for a long time. And so they actually decided that, that, that he, uh, he was persona non grata. And in that part of the world, you know, La Policia, basically, if you're powerful enough, you can get your, uh, get your will done. And actually, that brings me to a something I'd like to share with you about the, uh, um, and, and I saw the word shadow people. Uh, you're going to have to tell me exactly what you mean by that because it's a little cryptic too. But I'll tell you a blockchain story. I know a company that was hired to go into the country of Honduras to do a blockchain version of their land registry. So nobody could hack it. And it's because it was a problem. And it was because the big generals and politicians would come into the land title and go, I want to own that seaside land land there and the clerk would say sir someone else that belongs to someone else well change it make it mine so they were having land title fraud so they thought okay we'll put the blockchain in and it, you know it won't it won't happen anymore but the problem with that is there's always a human right so that's another moral of the story so now what would happen is the generale would come in and go i want to own that finca over there and they would say, no, senor, you cannot have that. And he would put a gun to your head and go, I'm going to own that finger, right? And so, yes, the blockchain is tamper evident. You would know that that happened. But you still have to have a way to do land titles. So a good moral of this story, probably, is, you know, beware. Um, if somebody has the intent to commit a fraud on you, it's probably pretty difficult to detect them. And the human factor is often going to be the way. There's a great XKCD cartoon that says, oh, no, he's using 4096-bit key and, and this kind of encryption. It'll take us months with supercomputers. And then the other character comes in and says, wait a minute, I've got a crowbar here. We'll just beat his password out of him. So please do know, those of you that are in the security profession, that, in fact, there is a, uh, uh, a human factor. I'm going to give you a little news you can use. If you go to CIOCAN.ca uh, and mouse around on there a bit, we've actually been running some fascinating sessions with some of Canada's top chief information security officers. And when I say we, I mean the CIO Association sponsors it. My colleague, Ron Murch, a retired professor from the Haskane School of Business, and I sit in on the session. Sometimes we talk and we take notes. 
And they're under what's called Chatham House rules. So nothing is attributed to these people except for a few, like uh, Bobby Singh, who's the CISO of TMX, the, the stock exchange in Toronto. He allows us to use his name because he's the moderator. But if you read these things, and there's about five blog posts up there now from these sessions, you're going to learn some stuff about identity management. You're going to learn some stuff about industrial process control from people who do this for a living and are paid handsomely. And I should mention that computer security does pay handsomely. So that was my commercial number one. My commercial number two, um, I am the board chair of a, uh, the Information and Communications Technology Council of Canada. So all you have to remember is ICTC. If you were to Google that, you'd find this. Why am I telling you this? Because one of the nice things is if you can do something to help somebody else out. And we all know, I'm sure, people who used to have jobs as petroleum engineers, jobs like that, that went away. And the funny thing is, a lot of those people would make darn good computer people. And there's a lot of computer jobs that have, uh, that have opened up in Calgary. Bow Valley College, in partnership with us and the university and others, are running a program called Edge Up. And I know because as the board chair, I know all about it, but I've been invited to the cohort graduation, which is coming up soon. So in a nutshell, what the Edge Up does is it takes people who are unemployed, but are smart and technical, it figures out what they know. So if you're a petroleum engineer, you know statistics, you know, you've got the math background, you've got the logical thinking, Maybe you don't know Java. Maybe you don't know Python. I mean, there's, there's gaps like that, but you probably can learn them pretty quickly. So as a result, in a fairly short space of time with program delivers like Bow Valley College, we go out there and we give those people those skills. And the employment success is phenomenal because these people come out ready to walk into a job. Now, it may not pay the wage they got before, but it's going to pay more than half that anyway. So what you need to do is think about helping other people like that. And again, if people come to you with security questions, I, uh, I get asked about privacy and there are people who just come to me with horror stories, try to help them out. I mean, I'm gonna close in about a minute, just basically by saying, let's all give back. Okay, I remember for a while, the uh, Kips chapter up in Edmonton, let people come down to the, uh, uh, the arena there with their sick virus laden computers and debug them. Now, I'm not suggesting you go do that. Um, there are businesses that do that just fine now. But find ways that you can give back to society. I try to do that with my talks. Um, one more plug for my book, Technocrete. You can read it online. You can buy a hard copy from Amazon. Uh, I'll autograph it the next time I see you. And on, on that happy note, unless there are more questions showing up in the chat line, uh, I think we're coming up to our time limit here. So I'm going to uh, stop talking and just watch the chat line for a minute or two. Okay. Thanks very much for your attention.